5th. Happy Cinco de Mayo, everyone. And a special shout out to my wife. Uh, this is her birthday. <laughs> and so it's uh, always a, a perfect day uh, for us to celebrate and makes it really easy for me to remember. <laughs> so that's important, too. Um, and of course, uh, an important day of celebration among our Mexican-American uh, brothers and sisters celebrating the commemoration of a very important milestone in a war uh, that they won. Um, so with that, uh, today we are going to be discussing, this is a work session, and so we will be voting today on a number of budget items. And specifically today, we're going to be discussing the creation of three mobile crisis outreach teams and the annualization of six therapist positions, community-based homelessness, uh, the community-based homeless court program, um, the mobile health clinic services, health care for the uninsured, specifically Montgomery Cares, Care for Kids, and our county dental program. And we will also be discussing um, a proposal that I'd like to put forward uh, regarding social, social isolation for seniors. And I'll explain that when we get to that item a little bit further today. Uh, we have a number of outstanding representatives from our Department of Health and Human Services. And we also have great representatives from our Office of Man Management and Budget here as well. And we have um, uh, members of our public health team uh, led by Dr. Travis Gale. So thank you all uh, for participating this morning. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kroll to make some introductory comments. And then I will turn it over to Ms. Yao and Ms. McMillan, uh, who tag teamed um, um, this uh, uh, session today, and I'm being reminded by, by staff, we're going to start with item number three uh, to be able to accommodate some juggling schedules this morning. Uh, but before we get to item number three, Dr. Kroll, if you'd like to make some opening comments. Good morning to you all, to everyone. Uh, Council Chair, or Chairman Albernos, thank you, and, and members, members of the committee for giving another opportunity to come to talk to you about uh, what I see as our our recovery, our year of recovery budget um, for 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 HHS. You know, the obviously last year was a was a telling and trying year, and I am optimistic that uh, members of my department, uh, Dr. Gales, um, and Dr. Santiago, all the folks you'll hear from today, will be talking to you not only about about our experience and what has happened to us during COVID, but the, but the lessons that we have learned um, and what we hope to take forward coming out of this. Uh, when I signed under this project, under this job, I, I, access and navigation were sort of priority issues for me uh, as, as the director of the department. And I have, I thought I had an understanding of what that was. It's way, way, way more um, involved and complicated. And we've learned a lot more uh, about what that means than, than I ever thought possible. Um, but as we think about this, you know, we've regionalized services and we've done regionalization of outreach. And I think there's more of that. We've done uh, digital access and we're still working on, on promoting that, but also at the same time addressing the digital divide, which requires that we be physically in places and spaces in the county and that we find ways to do that in a way that, that, is, that is agile and flexible and meeting the needs of, of the community. Racial equity and social justice and the disparities that we've seen this year continue. And we, we are also thinking about ways to, to address those as we go forward. Uh, this, this budget is, rec is about recovery but not just about health, it's about health and well-being and about thriving youth and families and how do we get um, that priority back in place for our families and strengthen it. Um, it's, it's about older adults and how do we help them to your point a moment ago. And it's about persons with disabilities and helping everybody that we serve, that we encounter and every resident of the county to be able to, to live, a, a, uh, live life to the fullest in Montgomery County. So. I won't belabor the point. You've got a full agenda and, and a lot of richness in, for us to talk about in the, in the next couple of hours. So I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kroll. And just one other housekeeping note. We have to be finished by noon uh, so that this um, uh, feed uh, can be utilized for the county executives um, by weekly press conference. So, and I think we will be comfortably done by then, but just uh, to, to make that note. So we're gonna be dis uh, starting our discussion regarding the Kresge grant um, so, Ms. Yao, if you could uh, walk us through this item. Absolutely. Good morning. Um, so, for fiscal year 22, the executive is recommending a reduction of $750,000 to the Administrative Children, Youth, and Families Program. Um, it's due to the expiration of the Kresge Opportunity Ecosystem Grant. The funding has been used to support a two-generation systems approach to poverty alleviation in the Up County and East County regions. 
Um, the effort has focused on promoting collaboration across public and private sectors, integrating service delivery, community engagement, and economic development. Um, so the uh, accomplishments, the challenges created by COVID and responses to these challenges are briefed in your packet. HHS representatives are available to provide a summary to the committee, um, but the grant is scheduled to expire in March, 2022. And Children, Youth and Family Services reports that it is working on strategies to um, sustain the work until the end of the year. And the governance committee of uh, the project is working on sustaining resources that have been devoted to the ecosystem long-term. So the committee may wanna hear more details about you know, the grant, as well as plans to continue staffing and functions of the opportunity coaches and care coordinators as well as client support resources and administrative functions after the grant expires. And in any case, the committee may wanna request a mid-year update on the transitioning of that, the project. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Barnes, would you like to follow up? Uh, okay, so my video is disabled. Uh, there it is. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm having some technical difficulties this morning, but um, thank you so much for your interest <clears throat> in the Kresge work that we've been doing in East County. Um, we have, over the last two and um, a half years, been working on two aspects of the work. One is the direct service provided in East County, and the second is uh, governance work to look at how we might build on the concept of ecosystems. And in that work, we use the Kresge funds to support both the work in East County and to uh, create um, collaboration with the thriving Germantown effort. Um, when we started our governance work, we had a strong membership from um, thriving Germantown uh, case managers as well as their program manager. We looked at ways where we could um, try and implement similar, um, similar concepts in terms of how we provide services in the community. We looked at the pathway model that Thriving Germantown used and wanted to implement that in East County, but on a smaller scale because the funding that we had only allowed us to provide um, three positions in East County. In East County, we have what we call a care coordinator or a lead worker and two opportunity coaches. The opportunity coaches work at, in detail with families to help them not only identify other programs that we could refer them to for supports, but then also to walk them through to make sure that they carried out those connections. So in many instances, we give information and referral. The customer has to then take the initiative to take those next steps on their own. With the um, <clears throat> coaches, we were able to provide support to families, to check in them on a weekly basis over the course of approximately six months to help them make all of those connections to help assess where they were when they came into the East County project and where they were at the end of those six months. So the opportunity coaches have been doing that work in the community. That work has continued during the pandemic. Um, we reported uh, in the packet statistics regarding the number of families that those staff helped to support throughout the course of the Kresge grant as well. <clears throat> excuse me, as well as during the pandemic. We also um, were able to provide some demographics in terms of the families that we serve and continue to serve in East County. A few things I'd like to point out, um, part of the work at East County um, that was supported by the um, Kresge Foundation had to do with committees that we set up that involved not only the community partners, but parents and families as well. We had a parent engagement committee, a health and wellness committee, um, a, um, and a community 
out, a, a community outreach um, committee. Um, the strongest two of those have been the Health and Wellness Committee, which continues to thrive and is um, ironically uh, following your comments, Council um, Member uh, Albanas. We're we're doing some work with seniors in East County, particularly now that the uh, facility is on um, co-located on the um, grounds where the East County um, Center is. Our staff have been. Um, when they were in the office, when they are in the office, located in the East County Regional Service Center. Um, but the other committee that works with uh, parent engagement has actually continued to have events during the pandemic. They switched from face-to-face -to, -face to a virtual um, environment, and they've continued to do different types of um, activities with families that engage both parents and children um, to give them some options to um, come together with their neighbors um, and for parents and children to interact. Um, as far as uh, sustaining the grant, we know that the, 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 the grant was extended because we were um, slow getting started after uh, we created our governance, but to actually start the direct services um, we started a little later than the funds came. So Kresge gave us a no cost extension, which basically just gave us more time to spend out the money that they had um, granted us. Um, what we have found is that, um, that when that money runs out in March of 22, we see this project morphing into additional HHS work in two ways. Number one, um, we have been working closely with the um, APHSA, the Association of, I'm going to get that wrong, the um, Public Health and Human, Public Human Service Association, um, and with um, community action agencies to look at some models around serving families using the what we started as the two gen um, approach and now is morphing into a whole family approach. Um, we see the work that we've done in Kresge um, having a direct impact on what now is going to transfer over to community service agency with a grant that came from Department of Human Services where they will be looking at a similar model to have uh, individual coaches working out of the test center. So we do see that by having connections through our governance committee, the models that we set up in East County are expanding to other areas. So we, we're glad to see that happening in the test center. In addition to that, within HHS, what we used to know as the Neighborhood Opportunity Network is being revamped into a different regional model where we will use navigators to do outreach and navigation in specific communities throughout the county, those communities where we have the highest need. Again, that has been influenced by the work that we've done here in East County. So we think that we've benefited from the investment that Kresge has put in East County, both by direct service delivery to the families in that community, and second, by building a governance structure that has allowed the lessons that we've learned there to be expanded into other bodies of work that we're doing in the department. So I would pause there and um, be willing to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you, Ms. Barnes. I just had a massive flashback. Um, so I remember the meeting, I, I attended the first meeting at East County convened by HHS six years ago when we were pulling the team together to go after this grant. <laughs> so and to, deciding whether or not we would even apply for it. Um, great so, library. <laughs> yeah, when, when you're around long enough, uh, these things come full circle. Um, so, uh, okay, so, yeah, and I'm very familiar with um, the process, the very intentional and well thought through process that was set up uh, to be able to apply for the grant in the first place, uh, which formed some alliances and partnerships and created community trust which it sounds like uh, continued through the duration 
of the grant. And thank you uh, to the Kresge Foundation for this investment, because um, clearly it, it has produced some significant dividends in establishing a stronger safety net in the eastern part of the county, which Lord knows we've had to leverage this last year uh, in very unique ways. And, and I would argue that the incredible work of our Regional Service Center Director Drew Bande, uh, through the partnerships, and he played a critical role in the development um, uh, of this grant request in pulling together community stakeholders to the table, who in many instances were coming because of the relationship with Jeru. Um, yeah. and, and I think that those relationships, you know, were maintained and, and expanded upon, especially this last year. So I think that there's proof in the pudding um, that the grant has really uh, led to some some good things and some strong infrastructure. I guess just two quick basic questions. It did technically fund three positions. Um, and so will those positions be maintained? Uh, do we anticipate absorbing them in some other way? Um, are you concerned at all about the direct cost or personnel aspect of this? Currently, um, the three positions are not county merit positions, they are um, a broker or contractual positions. Um, what we expect to see happen is that those positions may go away, but the families in East County will benefit from one, the case manager or the care coordinator, I'm sorry, program manager that we have in East County, which is a merit position that we contributed um, out of our uh, county funded dollars, that position will continue. One of the things that position will focus on is to make sure that East County has a strong connection with the Navigator outreach model that we're creating. Um, I'm gonna call it, it's going to be the um, recreation of the Neighborhood Opportunity Centers. You may recall um, the Neighborhood Opportunity Networks did not have a presence in East County. But as that morphs into the Navigator Outreach Model, our program manager will make sure that East County is represented in the um, caseload of uh, those, those workers as that model expands across the county to several high need areas. Um, we have not considered for this budget uh, a request to um, extend those positions beyond the end of this grant. And that's something that we would decide to do as part of um, the next year's budget, if, if that's a decision that we make. So at this time, we have not made a decision to continue them. Um, we do believe that the structures that we put in place, that the resources that we put in place through the committee work and through our connection with the East County Regional Service Center, will continue to provide strong supports for families. They know the services are there. I think we've done a good job of um, connecting families with the resources that are available, and hopefully that will uh, not go away. Thank you. Um, and then just a final point, um, our hub model, uh, which has been, you know, real, really innovative and exciting. Um, I think there's a, you can draw a direct line between what we've established here in East County and the general framework for that model. So I think that presents another opportunity for us. It's just thinking about it in a different way, um, but I think another another asset um, that we've been able to establish that in, in to a large degree, uh, you know, carries out what we've built here in East County, but more formally in the way of an initiative and a program with an infrastructure. So uh, that's another dot that we can connect here. Yes, and I'm but so glad that I wanted to say that uh, in East County, it was one of the, because of the structure we have with this project, it was one of the first places that we were able to make a strong connection between the community resource hub and the East County team that came from HHS. So they are on site at the hub um, and, and it was easy to get that staff to move to that location People knew them, they were familiar with them, and they could give plenty of information um, to residents that came in for other resources at Kingdom Fellowship. So um, 
we don't think that that model will change. HHS's intent is to keep a presence at that community hub. Um, so I, I don't think that will be threatened by the end of this grant. That is our intent in children so, need services to support that hub. So Councilmember Robert knows it is the intent of HHS to support that. Um, and I would say that, that um, yes, to, to, to just contradict you in a little bit, everything changes. <laughs> but this is an evolutionary process that is built on the things and the lessons that we've learned in East County uh, over the years. The consolidated hubs are part of that thinking about how do we do things in a more re in a regional way and understand things regionally and connect HHS into those regions as well. Uh, and, and a lot of that is 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 uh, lessons learned before COVID and during COVID uh, in East County with, with the Kresge Initiative. The other thing is that as we look internally at re standing up a navigation system for HHS and, and, and strengthening that, there are people in, in positions that uh, we're gonna be recruiting. Um, and and, and my, my fondest hope is that, that we'll be able to retain some of the institutional knowledge of folks that they, will, they would be interested in, we'd be able to bring them to, uh, into that fold with us as we go forward. So, but that knowledge to, to, to Joanne's point will not be lost. Uh, and that relationship with East County will, will remain strong beyond the life of the grant itself. Appreciate that. Uh, Council Member Rice. Yes, yeah, so just very quickly, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, because you, you really touched on what I wanted to talk about, which is that this work, and, and Dr. Kroll, thank you for saying that, um, the thriving Germantown hub model that we've been working on for years now um, really is something that has now morphed and I think will follow into this next iteration. Coupling that with what we see with the regional consolidation hub and having those two entities really gives us the framework to stabilize all of these things that are being done here in this instance. And so from that perspective, I really do believe that there is a way. Um, and when we looked at what happened, and uh, Mr. Chair, you talk about this often in terms of what Germantown was able to accomplish. Uh, you know, the reality is, is it was based on the great work that had already been done with Thriving Germantown uh, and getting us to that point. And so now we can continue to spread this throughout the county to and, and in other iterations and really doing this type of work uh, under those auspices is exactly what we need to do. So it's not necessary. And so I hear you in terms of it not being necessary to follow under this current uh, iteration. But the, the mechanisms and the work will still continue, but under this new model of how we're going to move forward with connecting people with services and giving them the support that's necessary. So I just want to say I agree uh, wholeheartedly with the direction. I think it's phenomenal. It ties in with what we've always asked when it came to the Thriving Germantown hub model, which is an incorporation back into HHS in some respects and not having this outside of, but then also having our, uh, our uh, public-private uh, communications there because of that partnership and we know that they do a lot of the work around some of the supports that are there so having them right there uh, accessible uh, not only to HHS staff but more importantly to the clientele themselves uh, just made complete sense so again just say just want to say thank you uh, I think this is headed in the right direction and so after the grant expires I think it'll get us to where we need to which is really this new way of thinking uh, a new approach through HHS. So thanks guys. Yeah, that was well said. I'll just say last two, two points in this. Um, it would be great if you all could uh, just send some formal communication or we can do this through our staff as well in partnership to our district colleagues uh, who represent the Eastern part of the county, both council members Hucker and Navarro, because uh, they are not gonna have the benefit of this uh, context and discussion when they see a loss of funding in their district, understandably that's gonna raise some red flags, but I think that um, what, what has been described today uh, is an evolution of the program that um, um, the, the goals of which have been and to a large degree met uh, in establishing this infrastructure. And now we're going to evolve it as we look at the hub and other models. Um, and so we're, we're not abandoning this program, it's just evolving to the next phase, which is what was always the intent in the first place. So um, Ms. Yao or, or Ms. Barnes, if you guys could work together on sending something specifically or just your colleagues, I'd appreciate it. Um, and Ms. Yao, I don't think there's any action required here. Is that correct? This was just an update on why that, a highlight. 
sorry, uh, it would just be uh, a recommending approval of the okay. executive's uh, recommendation recommended funding. Okay, so uh, without. Yep. Okay, cool. Agreed. We're good. So, yes, we do. Uh, uh, the committee supports. Thank you, Miss Barnes. Uh, appreciate you. Uh, I know you have to head off to another meeting, but thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. All right, so we're going to go back up towards the top. Um, and so we will next discuss our, I believe, uh, the creation of our three mobile crisis outreach teams and the annualization of six therapist positions. And we are now joined by um, our colleague and friend, Ms. McMillan. Ms. McMillan, if you could walk us through this packet, part of the packet. You have um, several items in this one packet that we'll work through, but you are correct. The first one uh, is the items that are related to the creation of three additional mobile crisis outreach teams and also the executive putting in the funding for the annualization for the six positions that the council approved through the special appropriation last summer. Um, there is information in the packet, and, and I would just start by saying this is really consistent with the updates that HHS and public safety have had along the way. Last year, when the council approved the clinical positions, um, Dr. Kroll, uh, you know, did speak about some of the other types of positions, like peer support, uh, positions that could kind of fill out these teams, and so you'll see uh, the six new positions are a, a little different mix, but in the end, when they're all hired, we would end up with six new teams uh, that can be deployed. And there is also some information uh, updating you on the hiring process for the six positions that were approved last summer. And so I think with that, I would just turn it over to Dr. Kroll and Dr. Santiago and Ms. Hill um, to give you their updates uh, on, on where we are with these. And also a little description of what the new positions are and how they'll work together. So I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna uh, delay, delay us in any kind of way. I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Uh, Santiago who can walk you through this. He's been working it since he joined us um, and maybe since before he joined us. So, um, and I'll just fill in any gaps along the way. So Dr. Santiago, how are yours? You're muted. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak with you this morning. Um, absolutely, this has been sort of the bread and butter of my tenure uh, so far. Not just uh, the, the building up of the uh, mobile crisis units, but the whole crisis now model, um, integrating the call centers, um, the mobile crisis outreach units, but then also the stabilization center and now we're even talking about an interim, some interim stabilization centers and, um, and also what do we do once we stabilize people? What kind of, of opportunities, beds, um, services are available for, for people who have experienced a crisis? So, all, so this conversation um, has to be viewed in the context of, of that uh, greater effort that is quite exciting for Montgomery County. And um, we're grateful for the tremendous support that we've gotten from all parts of, of the community in these efforts. Um, with respect uh, to the specific positions, uh, let me comment on the six positions that uh, you funded. Um, we have hired uh, three of them, uh, uh, an additional two um, have accepted uh, positions and uh, there are interviews on the final six one. And our best hope is that we will have the six positions funded by the end of the year. Uh, together with this, um, as you're aware, um, we've wanted to also open up a couple of um, uh, new locations uh, beyond just the card drive. Um, and right now, uh, there are a lot of conversations going on, especially in the Silver Spring area. Staff have visited uh, two locations. We're in contact with DGS. We're exploring the costs. Um, but one thing that I should uh, point out is that the Silver Spring area has, um, has benefited already with a 24-7 uh, team that has existed um, for, for quite a while. In fact, um, my colleague uh, Dornay Hill and I did 
some quick statistics and we ended up um, understanding that 60% uh, of the calls um, in from July of 2020 to December of 2020 uh, were in the Silver Spring area. Um, so we're all, we already provide uh, quite a presence, but the opportunity to be right there um, at, uh, close to the downtown area will also make um, uh, response times uh, quicker, but also engage with the community more directly. So we're looking forward to that. Um, we have been uh, deploying more than just one team with uh, three new positions. So uh, uh, especially on Friday evenings and some other evenings of the week uh, when uh, calls are high, uh, we've been uh, deploying uh, already uh, uh, two teams and uh, we hope to be deploying uh, three teams soon once we got, get the six positions. And then there was a reference made to the peer support specialists, which are funded in fiscal year 22 that um, you have um, for consideration um, and approval. So there are uh, four, uh, four peer support specialists and two therapist positions that um, are being proposed. Um, and uh, uh, with those, we, as Linda said, we will be able to expand to uh, six teams uh, in fiscal year uh, 22. Uh, there's so much more. Um, that I could talk about. This is all exciting work, but I think I'll pause uh, there and entertain any questions. And uh, I, perhaps uh, Dornay and uh, Dr. Kroll may have any, some comments as well. Ms. Hill, did you wanna add anything? No, not at this time. Okay. Um, well, we we received a, a really good briefing on this uh, from from um, you know a few weeks, a couple months ago. So I, I a lot of our questions regarding methodology and process were answered then, uh, and it sounds like progress continues to be made both in bringing these positions and onboarding them. And I I know uh, from speaking to community stakeholders that to your all's credit, they have already uh, reached out to. Uh, as we had requested, um, um, especially business partners, community-based organizations to establish relationships and trust. So that that is ongoing. Um, and I, I so I, I don't have any further questions. I, I really appreciate your all's leadership and the expansion of the program, uh, recognizing its importance. Um, I'll only note that you know this this is a complex web of uh, of a system. So the referral process is critical. Um, and these need to be, um, you know, soft referrals uh, that that you know, not just cold referrals. And I know that we're we're establishing a broader system um, to address some of those other holistic needs, which have a lot of layers to them that go beyond just these individual positions, because they alone aren't going to be able to do this work themselves, and we all know that. Um, but um, I, Dr. Kroll, looks like you want to chime in. Yeah, I just wanted to, to anticipate the Council Member Glass. Um, and thinking about homelessness in this process. And, and to say that one of the things that I've asked the team to do and ask us to think about is to not think about this as mobile crisis outreach team as a thing, as a single thing, but mobile crisis as a piece of what Dornay and Philando are working on in terms of this, those teams, but outreach team as a broader concept for us that includes the work that uh, um, Seth and, and, and Ms. Harris are doing uh, in terms of outreach to homeless folks on the streets. Uh, and, and that uh, STEER is doing in terms of outreach to folks who are, who are um, um, overdosing or in the, in, the, in the throes of an addiction. So that we've got a team that has those warm handoffs and talks to each other and understands the roles of each other in a way that allows us to do smooth transitions so that if someone on the street who's doing an outreach work for, for Seth identifies a psychiatric emergency, they can pull, call the team, the crisis team to come out and do that piece of work or a substance abuse assessment and, and potentially get them into stabilization as we go forward. So it is really much more, the mobile crisis teams are really the core of a much larger effort that includes police and fire and rescue, uh, every mind uh, and, and, and other parts of, of HHS. And you were right, you anticipated uh, Councilmember Glass, he's in the queue and would like to follow up. Go ahead, Councilmember Glass and then Councilmember Rice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And yeah, Dr. Kroll, add mind reader uh, to your title as well. You were, you were uh, spot on on everything you said uh, in addition to, to me wanting to talk about this. And so um, 
Dr. Santiago, thank you uh, since coming on board, you know, dedicating a lot of your time and, and efforts to, to making sure we, we, we get this right or improve upon the foundation that we've had. Uh, and, you know, in, in your opening comments, you had talked about the Silver Spring District, and, and clearly that is uh, the area where this is most acute and where we know the businesses and community partners and residents uh, see this uh, and see the need for this. And so that's why uh, the chair uh, alluded to it uh, and, and I'm explicitly stating it. And so, you know, over the last year or so since we've uh, beefed up these efforts uh, in the last budget and we were slow to uh, hire and bring on board uh, some of these uh, teams or individuals. Um, I think you had mentioned that Silver Spring was not included because there is a 24-7 response. Can you can you go back to that and just expand upon the, uh, those comments? Yeah, I, I'll reiterate what I mentioned that uh, currently, um, and I think for the, in the history of the 24-7 team, they have been responding to the Silver Spring area. And uh, like I mentioned, um, uh, Dornay and I did um, a little bit of uh, some statistical analysis and uh, we found out that 60% of the calls have been done in the Silver Spring area by the 24-7 team. And that was during the pandemic. Um, so we're, I think that there's already a considerable engagement um, uh, in the Silver Spring area, and we want to engage even more uh, by by having a locate having them uh, located, having office space right there, uh, working together with uh, the shelters, working with fire and rescue. We already have a relationship with a fire and rescue. We have a relationship with a regional director's office, and they're all very excited. They they wanted us to be in their office space, but it just wasn't quite adequate, so we're still exploring um, other, you know, other locations, but the partnerships have just been extremely strong and uh, very helpful. So um, we're moving in, in the direction. Yeah, I hope I didn't leave any impression whatsoever that the Silver Spring area has not been attended to. I think, I think we, have, we have been doing so and now increasingly so. No, uh, you're correct. You did not leave that impression. I just wanted to engage a little further and and uh, and, and hear just about how how those uh, interactions and, and, and the interplay would work. But with regard to the the other six, uh, the new six that are being proposed, are there uh, geographic um, or programmatic areas that you hope to deploy them? How, where where do you think that they would go or be focused in the county? Um, they they likely will be in the Silver Spring area. So, I mean, that whole model is also new to us of pairing a peer support specialist with a therapist. Um, so that's a, a whole area of growth. Uh, the good news is that in the last two or three weeks, thanks to conversations uh, we've had with Dr. Kroll and, and some others, um, we, be, we believe we might be able to pair. We don't have to wait until... Um, until we get the positions funded, uh, we may be able to use some of the STEER uh, peer support specialists and start matching them. So that's kind of some of the latest thinking that we've had. And together with Dornay and her staff at the Crisis Center, uh, we're in conversations of how, how to start make, making that happen. And I haven't spoken about a couple SAMHSA grants that we've applied for. And because we don't have them, it's not a bird in hand. I may, I may, I want to be cautious, but uh, we're we're going for um, uh, in one grant for two million to expand uh, the mobile crisis units even further to eight teams, um, and uh, also another another grant for an interim stabilization center. Um, but I'm not going to go there right now because it's it, we don't have the bird in hand yet, um, sure. and. Uh, but well, it's well all... you, you've whet our appetite already in these budget conversations <laughs> about what you've applied for. So fingers crossed, uh, all, all of us have our fingers and toes crossed for you. Um, so, so thank you for just letting us know. And the only other um, kind of comment and question I have, and, and Dr. Kroll mentioned this as well, you know, the interaction between, um, you know, DHHS and, uh, and our uh, police and fire and rescue and everybody else. And, 
there, there have been a number of conversations, um, some public and, and some that I've had with, with you all about uh, MCPD and very specifically um, some concerns among uh, individuals experiencing homelessness and some providers with regard to the interactions that have uh, come to light recently in the last few months, particularly with those uh, with officers who are uh, detailed and assigned in the Silver Spring area, particularly with uh, the incident that happened at the East Silver Spring Elementary School. And so the concerns that have come to me are about individuals who are just concerned, um, not unsure uh, about their relationship with law enforcement. and. Uh, and I, I'm just curious how we're trying to mitigate that uh, and, you know, DHHS um, making sure that everybody feels safe in our community, right? That, that people feel safe when they're in shelter, when they're out on the street, uh, when they need mental health support or any other type of health care. Uh, and, and I know it's complex and I know uh, that, that M you, none of you are with MCPD um, and it is something that I have mentioned uh, to, to Chief Jones uh, myself. Uh, but, you know, it is relevant to this conversation just about safety. And so I don't know if anybody has any thoughts about this. I don't want to call anybody out in particular. Uh, I see Dr. Kroll. Yeah. Well, yeah, sure. I'll, 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 I'll take this one on a little bit because I've been, you know, the mobile crisis and outreach team effort was just the first phase of this process. And we've gone on to thinking about alternatives to SROs and what we might do in the schools uh, and 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 uh, additional work uh, around uh, what we might do to reimagine public safety. And all three of those things are beginning to dovetail in, and, and mesh together in some nice ways, I think. You know, out the, the, the mobile crisis outreach team effort is working with MPD and fire and rescue to, to implement a model that is uh, core to the crisis now model, but also to the cahoots model as well that you're, everybody's familiar with. And that is that, that working on strategy so that um, when there is a, a non, when the police don't need to be there, there's an alternative um, referral that they triage that that call as it comes in and make the decision about whether or not mobile crisis can respond or a civilian response can be made rather than a law enforcement response and whether we respond alone or with someone or after someone depends on how that triage works out so there's that ongoing effort to be clear about that and then to train and and, and retrain 911 and and the team to be able to manage those calls the other the other piece of this for us is is it as i'm in, in working with um Dr. McKnight and, and Chief Jones on on the, the with the task force, as is Rolando and some of his team members, on working through how do we come up with a, with a model for how we respond to school-aged children um, during the course of the day in much the same way, whether the school's responding or HHS is responding, or if necessary, law enforcement is responding. So it's a similar kind of effort. Um, and I, the, the Reimagining Public Safety Work Group implementation team is just now beginning to kick into operation in anticipation of the new year. So no doubt we will be there working through that and figuring out what our alternatives are for uh, across the department and across the county for, for um, intervention and diversion to, to away from, away from uh, the justice system unless absolutely necessary. Uh, I, I very much appreciate that response. Thank you for broadening it out in the context of reimagining public safety and how all of this interplays because we know that mental health is, uh, uh, is, is something that we need to provide support for and it should be a health support, not a law enforcement support, at least at the first go around. So, uh, so thank you for those efforts. Um, I clearly so support uh, this, this budgetary item uh, and just again, just really appreciate everything that everybody on this Zoom uh, and, and uh, all of your colleagues have been doing over the last year uh, to make sure that uh, some of our most vulnerable, vulnerable residents uh, have been safe. Uh, while they might not have a home to protect themselves during this pandemic, we have certainly provided safe spaces for them and provided them with the wraparound services that they need uh, to stay healthy. So thank you all very much. Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna try and be very brief because I do agree that we've had some of these conversations before, but Dr. Kroll, I do agree with you that 911 is certainly a linchpin uh, when it comes to this in terms of analyzing the type of event, making sure that it's very clear. Um, I know that when we had the incident uh, multiple times in Germantown that involved a gentleman who was experiencing uh, mental health uh, crisis, 
that was blocking up traffic at 118 and uh, Middlebrook. Um, that's a significant one on so many levels. Uh, one, because for the safety of the individual, uh, the safety of those who are trying to navigate through that uh, very uh, busy intersection, um, all of it just conflates together. And so the concern is, is that you have so many different levels of uh, challenges that are there and people calling 911 and requesting to have someone immediately respond, which ties into my next point, which is about transportation for the team and how if folks are going to be located uh, in primarily the Silver Spring area, how they would respond to an area like Damascus, an area like Darnstown, an area that's farther out, how would they get there quickly uh, to those types of places? Um, you know, they're not traveling in a police car that's got police lights or I assume don't have a police escort. Um, so from that perspective, how do you then get from where you're going to be uh, stationed to some of these areas. We've seen it with response times with fire and police and them having challenges in some of our remote areas in the county, especially the up county. And so while, while I'm supportive of what we're doing and where the majority of need is, and I agree, growing up in Silver Spring, it's always been and will continue to be uh, an area of need for us in the Silver Spring area, so I'm not refuting that. I'm just trying to understand how this process will work for getting to some of the other more remote areas of the county. So I, I'll, 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 I'll okay. kick into that and talk about what the what the larger the larger framework around this is, and that's that that we will always maintain it, one of the mobile crisis teams will always stay in 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 the in the Rockville area at the crisis center and be deployed from there. We'll put a team we'll put teams down in Silver Spring because that's where volume is. But we're also looking at putting teams up county as well, so the Germantown area. So we've got teams right. that are regionally spaced across the county to speed our response time and. In any given day and in any given incident, depending on what the issues are, the teams can redeploy and move so we can get someone on station. And if we need additional support, we can do that as well. But yes, I just want to clarify that we are looking to station a team in the up county area. We're just starting with the Silver Spring area because that's where the need is. But we are definitely working with DGS for space for Germantown or up county as well. We understand the need is, is just um, as crucial up there as well. Thank you. Thank you, guys. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So I think it sounds like without objection, we uh, approve the county executive's recommendations here. I would note, Ms. McMillan, maybe if we can uh, put a placeholder to come back to, in, in the fall um, to continue to get an update and then in, in include our uh, colleagues in MCPD uh, to talk about the intersection between law enforcement and mental health and some of the other key stakeholders that are part of this really broad and important initiative. And I know MCPD is all in on this, um, received updates uh, through the Public Safety Committee. All right, great, thank you so much. Uh, let's move on to the next item. Okay, and I would just say your, your periodic updates on the Crisis Now model have generally been joint public safety and HHS meetings. So um, I'm sure that we would schedule the next update that way as well. And I'll just note really quickly, Ms. McMillan, we've been joined by our council president, council member Hucker. Um, and uh, council member Hucker, we just uh, finished wrapping up discussing the update, the very positive update of the expansion of the mobile crisis uh, program initiative uh, that, that you helped co-lead along with me and, and, and was unanimously supported by council members. Was there anything you wanted to add before we move on to the next item? Uh -oh. Only my regrets for joining you late because of too many conflicts this morning, but my thanks for uh, moving this ahead. And uh, thanks to the executive branch and the county exec and Dr. Gales and Santiago and Pearl for, um, for moving this ahead and Linda, for all, all your hard work on this. So I think we're in a much better place than we were this time last year. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, Ms. McMillan, next item. The next item is a $100,000 item to create a community-based homeless court program. Uh, and uh, in early 2020, the Interagency Commission on Homelessness issued the report from the Committee on Decriminalization of Homelessness. Um, the full report's in your packet. Um, this is one of several issues that came forward, but this would create uh, not a court docket. In some jurisdictions, there actually are homeless court dockets in the court, but this actually would be a partnership between the state's attorney and the public defender's office and service providers, and it would take these misdemeanor um, cases and it would resolve them in a community-based setting. 
uh, and they would be placed on the STET docket. And then if there was compliance and progress um, with the plans that are agreed to within 90 days, then it would be null prost. And so this would, um, would keep these uh, minor, minor arrests, minor crime issues from being on people's records. It would take them out of the court system. And I think that this is you know, really similar, of course, to the council's discussion that you just recently had about the barriers to housing that come from having even minor arrests, minor convictions, um, even if it's a citation, having that on your record. And of course, you all have taken action to prevent that from being a barrier, but these kinds of things really are significant barriers. So, uh, and I would just say, uh, you know, this proposal actually came forward last year in the budget, but the council's continuity of services didn't provide for the funding. And of course, it wouldn't have been able to be on site anyway during the pandemic. But interestingly, during the pandemic, uh, the state's attorney and others, you know, have worked on alternative ways to clear out cases to make sure that people just aren't, you know, burdened with some of these things that are really misdemeanors that can be handled in an alternative to the court process. So I actually think the year of the pandemic has given some experience to how these things can be handled even without this formal program. Uh, the cost is estimated to be $100,000. Um, there's some startup costs. There's a program coordinator. There are things like transportation. It's expected that the first um, the first location would be at Progress Place, but there could be other locations depending, you know, on what we learn from where people are located who need to be served by this. And so uh, I'm recommending approval. I'll let Ms. Harris give you some um, comments on this, and I would just ask that you all get a written update by October 1st. And then um, if you were to schedule a session to come back and discuss it, we could discuss the whole report, all the recommendations and report at the same time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Harris, did you want to make some comments or have anything to add? Sure. Uh, Amanda Harris, Chief of Services to End and Prevent Homelessness. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, we are very excited about being able to get the homeless docket up and running. I think it is a critical component to our efforts, uh, both to decriminalize homelessness, but also to address the racial disparities. And we're so grateful for the Housing Justice Act and think that's going to make a big difference. But it'd be even better if people didn't have criminal charges in the, in the first place. So. Uh, so we are optimistic that this will uh, make a difference in people's lives. Uh, I will say that we are also going to be cautious that um, when people are involved in the homeless docket, that the requirements to drop the charges are not too burdensome. Um, we can't, you know, we want everyone to be housed, but we don't have housing resources for everyone. So we just, we want to be careful about um, what are the requirements to be able to drop those charges and the, that they're not more stringent or more burdensome than just having a, a, a misdemeanor. So, uh, but we, we feel confident that we'll be able to tackle that. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harris. I'll just make a couple of comments and then I know council members Glass and Rice would like to make comments on this as well. Just, you know, one of the coolest parts of this job, I've said this before, is this unique perch where we, the council in many ways is the intersection of public, private, nonprofit programs, initiatives, and uh, I am so proud to be a member of this council. Uh, we are taking significant steps in policy to address some of the barrier issues that cause homelessness in the first place, which is uh, a continuation of the great work of previous councils and our previous chair of the HHS committee. And uh, just you know, a couple highlights. Obviously, uh, the the effort co-led by Councilmember Glass and Councilmember Katz with unanimous support from all of our colleagues to uh, make it easier to access housing, uh, um, you know, despite folks' backgrounds. Uh, a lot of discussion on that, and we arrived in a really good place. And then Councilmember Rice and Councilmember Jawando co-leading the effort to make it easier to expand upon the already uh, strong success in policy in making it easier access jobs. <laughs> um, and so this, this is a great continuation of that. And I happen to uh, see uh, one of our circuit court judges this past weekend uh, who talked about this specifically. Um, and so our judicial partners are excited about uh, this launch and this pilot. And they too have been progressive. And he actually mentioned to me, and I'm going to talk to Councilmember Rice about this in a couple of weeks, 
because I have a feeling he's interested in it. Uh, there's something called reentry court, uh, which our colleagues in Prince George's County uh, have recently initiated in the last two years um, that connects very much to this discussion. We'll talk about that at some later point, um, but just we're, we're all rowing in the same direction here, uh, which is particularly exciting and, and, and a really good good news. Uh, with that, Councilmember Glass. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and you, you teed it up and summed it up uh, quite nicely. I mean, this has been an incredible team effort uh, from all of us on the council, everyone in the administration, and as you uh, rightfully noted, uh, those who've come before us and have put us into this position uh, to be able to build upon the successes and the proof is in the pudding. The update that we've received a few weeks ago uh, regarding the point in time count and everything else, and so, so we're really doing some some really important work. And and as uh, Ms. Harris, you noted, uh, all of the work to make sure those who are experiencing homelessness find uh, you know supportive housing, uh, permanent housing. Uh, it would also be good if if we if they don't have records to begin with, and this is. Uh, one way to to mitigate that, and you know, these conversations, uh, particularly about this this item, have been taking place at the ICH uh, and with uh, you know also with uh, the people's um, the homeless people's representation project as well. And so I'm just really glad to see this moving forward, uh, and I'm glad that all of us are dedicated to this effort. And that we're we're going to continue doing more things to help more people. And uh, you know the the proposal that Chair Albert has just suggested as well, looking at other jurisdictions to seeing what they're doing. And I know that this is being done in Baltimore, which is where where I first learned of it. And I'm glad that we'll be supporting this today and and getting this up and running. So uh, good stuff is happening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Rice. So I'm just going to lead with three words, which is this is awesome, um, and it's and it's and it's so terrific. And I see Amanda laughing because she knows. I mean, seriously, that's the this this is exactly uh, what we need to continue to do to provide touch points for folks, understanding that look, when a person oftentimes uh, is caught with public urination or whatever the case may be, there are oftentimes two things that are happening. One, it's that, well, they don't have a place to go. They're not allowed into a restaurant to use a public restroom. Uh, and so they end up going behind a building somewhere because that's the only place that they can use the bathroom. Um, so that's one. Or the other is they do it on purpose because they're trying to get arrested so that they can go to jail because they understand that that's a place where they can get some meals uh, and a warm place to sleep uh, that evening uh, because they don't want to be and choose not to be in uh, many of our shelters that are out there. Those are things that we've heard from individuals, right? Those are things that happen. And should a person, because we're not allowing them to go into a restaurant and use a restroom, or should a person, because they're not in the mental position to be able to uh, welcome the services that are being provided to them to help them, should we therefore create a criminal record for that? I don't think so. Uh, and I think that many in our community would argue that that's not the case. And that's what this is about. This is about compassion and understanding of a person's position and where they are, but also providing a touch point for them. Because my hope, and I agree with Ms. Harris, that it shouldn't be burdensome. And I hope that the only thing that we can do is really uh, continue to make sure that folks understand about the help that's available for them uh, and what we can offer them. Uh, and that needs to be how we lead with this in terms of ensuring that they understand uh, that help is there. Conversation with Councilmember Glass and I earlier uh, about another subject, and we're really talking about this, is about ensuring that folks realize how they're supported, how we want to help them to get back on track, and then giving them the resources uh, to be able to do that, whether it's job placement, whether it's, you know, stability in terms of the initial type of emergency housing, whether it's in a shelter or if it's in a, you know, an, another one of the facilities that we operate. Those are all things that we automatically assume that everybody knows and not everybody does. And so being able to have those uh, additional touch points and reminders, right? Every day is not the day that a person's ready to receive help. Anyone who's had any kind of addiction or knows someone in the family who's had an addiction understands that today is not the day, but tomorrow may be it. Uh, we've all seen it. 
with those of us who've worked with people who are experiencing homelessness and people who are challenged with kinds of conditions and are not ready to receive the help, but tomorrow can be that day. And so that's what this also provides is that opportunity for tomorrow, that opportunity for that to be the day in which you can reach someone uh, and, and have them open up their heart and their arms and say, yes, I accept your help. Uh, and that's what this is gonna provide for us. So I'm really excited. I just really wanna thank all of you who've worked on this, thank our lead for homelessness, uh, Council Member Glass. And uh, to you, Chair Albernos, let me just say this. Uh, sir, you know, I learned all of what I understood uh, about homelessness from uh, uh, then uh, Council Member Leventhal, who was a great leader and who did some amazing things. And I said when you came on board that you had big shoes to fill. Sir, you have continued to lead uh, HHS in a way that has been absolutely tremendous. And you see from the great accomplishments and strides that you have certainly hit the ground running. And so I'm just very proud to be a part of this committee, uh, to be under your leadership in this, because we are continuing to make great things happen. So thank you to both of you. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. Appreciate that. I'd be remiss not to acknowledge my colleague and friend, Beth Schumann, uh, who's watching in the audience right now, who's played a really important role in all of that. Um, just two, two final points on this. Uh, totally concur, Ms. McMillan, with coming back in October uh, to revisit implementation. I'd like to include, however, in that discussion, um, some of what Ms. Harris referred to as those back-end referrals uh, is are, are really important too. So as, as if we can bring folks to that discussion to make sure that uh, we have the infrastructure in place um, once this goes through uh, to, uh, to, to have folks refer to. And then I'm not sure if this is the appropriate place to do this, but if it's not, I'd love a subsequent session. There are some state policy barriers uh, um, with regards to referrals that remain a huge challenge because in addition to the two issues that Council Member Rice is absolutely correct, the third is and uh, when, when somebody is experiencing severe mental health challenges um, and, and we, we struggle uh, to, to make a placement um, because of well-intentioned uh, but, but challenging policy issues at the state level and the referral process. So um, we'll, we'll, if we can follow up on that too, I'd appreciate it. But uh, without objection then colleagues, uh, we support this $100,000 recommendation from the executive. Next. Um, the next item is actually uh, a, a big one and it's a big investment and um, hopefully we'll have tremendous outcomes to help, but it's the uh, development of a mobile health clinic and so there are staff in DHHS, as well as the purchase of the vehicle that's needed to be outfitted as the clinic. And the total cost between the two is 879,218. There are five positions associated um, with this effort. The executive's budget does describe this as one of the strategies to address disparities. And I will um, you know, ask HHS to give you an overview of this. They do have a lot of information that has been provided about the work they've done to, of course, work on identifying uh... No, Ms. McDonald, I think you froze. I was afraid it was my computer. No. Um, if we could, Ms. McMillan, maybe if you could um, log off and log back in. And she was about to turn it over to our HHS team, but I don't want to start until she comes back on board because it's important she hear the entire context of the discussion. And it's good to see you, Dr. Rogers and Dr. Gales. Thanks for joining us.
why don't we take a three minute recess <laughs> uh, and come back on at 1040. It's 1037 according to my clock. So let's come back at 1040. Am I back in? You are. I am. Okay. okay. No, no. I, um, I had a power surge, so I'm not sure what's going on. I'll be back soon. down so we can jump back in. Countdown in five, four, three, two, one. All right, we're back. Uh, Ms. McMillan, you were uh, mid-sentence and I think close to turning this over to the HHS team to discuss this proposal uh, for um, mo mobile medical practices, but if you could uh, finalize your thoughts. So um, I just wanted to say that the positions that are being uh, added are two community service aides, a social worker, a nurse practitioner, and a driver. Um, I do wanna have the department give you an overview of the initiative. Um, it has tremendous potential. I do have a couple thoughts, one about the um, source of funding, and then also about how DHHS and the committee will work to um, get more information on what we really expect the outcomes to be. 
but I do want to turn it over to the department to give you uh, an overview of the initiative. Well, I'm going to, without, without any fanfare, turn this over to Dr. Gales and Dr. Rogers to talk about, um, and, and the only thing I will say is that as we think about this issue of regionalization and reaching out across the county, we know there are hard, there are places that are difficult to reach and there, there are transportation issues and, and, uh, disparity issues that, that we think this is part of our, our larger solution uh, as we as the department goes forward to try to address those. So, Dr. Gales, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's nice to be talking with you all about non-COVID related things. Uh, as a as a as a side, uh, I was talking with one of my colleagues from uh, another part of the state yesterday, uh, and we were actually having a discussion about non-COVID related things. And it was like, wow, these, you know, help continues to happen and move forward. So uh, thank you all for your continued engagement around these issues and your continued support as we move forward. Um, I will just say some brief comments and Dr. Uh, share the floor with Dr. Rogers, who has been working with the team who put together the budget uh, list for the mobile services, as well as some of those other conversations related to dental. But the premise behind the mobile services uh, unit came up several years ago, uh, where we were thinking about, we had an opportunity to potentially have some extra money uh, and looking at opportunities to grow our programs. And at that time, um, our colleagues in Anne Arundel County had purchased a mobile vehicle specifically related to opioid overdoses and uh, outreach in that area. And we looked to that as a potential model that we could use and leverage to support a host of different programs, not only within public health services, but also across the HHS continuum uh, and to provide some flexibility. Now, our impression was that this was not supposed to be a standalone clinic that we would pick up and move around, but a multi-purpose vehicle that could be used for a host of different activities and a host of different types of outreach. And for example, even when the in the pandemic, there's been multiple instances where we could have benefited from having a mobile apparatus, whether it's around testing or certainly in this space right now around vaccination. So that's some context behind how this originally came up several years ago and we're thankful for the opportunity to have ongoing conversations about it. And Dr. Rogers will give some more specifics, but we, I will say we did pattern a lot of our uh, budget and configuration around what this would look like around the information that was provided to us from our colleagues in Anne Arundel County, modeling it after uh, the costs associated with the initial purchase, maintenance, and sustainability of that particular vehicle. Dr. Rogers. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gales. Um, good morning, uh, Council uh, President Hucker, uh, Vice President Albert Hills, Councilman Rice, Councilman Glass. Um, just add a couple items from an operational standpoint. Um, I think, but as Dr. Gales mentioned, this idea of a mobile health clinic, it predates my 13 months with the county. Um, but it's important to me because I remember growing up in Baltimore City, just, just blocks from the uprest that uh, transpired several years ago. And when I was a young adult, I was fortunate to have, have received services from a mobile health clinic. And so I know the importance of having such an apparatus um, to address healthcare access or increase the healthcare access and to address health disparities in our most vulnerable communities. And so uh, we're gonna be using uh, data-driven approaches. Um, we're gonna be using data to really identify the most needed, the, the most needy areas within our county. We're going to be targeting those hot spots with um, evidence-based standards of care, uh, um, so that we can do additional COVID-19 uh, testing and vaccination, so we can take immunizations to people's doorsteps, so that we can um, identify social needs and provide linkages to health and human services care uh, within our most uh, vulnerable communities, also. And also, as you see in your packet, we have a very diversity of staff. Um, in fact, we, we, we designed the team so that the team can address both um, health and social needs. And so we have uh, two CSAs who will operate as community health workers. Uh, we'll have a licensed social worker on board of the mobile health clinic, and we'll have a, a family uh, nurse practitioner who will be trained in uh, various aspects of the, of the delivery of, of a, a nursing care or, or that higher level of care. 
we also want to point out that uh, we intend to, to make hiring preferences to those individuals who speak uh, more than one language. Um, it's, it's going to be important for us that the nurse practitioner, that the social worker, and at least one CSA or community health worker uh, speaks not only English, but Spanish or one of the other most common languages uh, within the county. I will also say that we're going to make a, a concerted and committed effort to make sure that we have diversity and partners throughout the county. Uh, we're going to commit to partner, partner with our concerted um, consolidation hubs, um, our HHS colleagues, um, the Minority Health Initiative programs, other departments throughout the county, um, and NCPS. And so we know that there are some strategic relationships, services um, that we can deliver. I also say that we're going to also uh, make a commitment in this plan to make sure that we have uh, strong, both quantitative and qualitative evaluation and monitoring of outcomes. Um, I did read in the packet, there were some questions that council may have about how we're gonna monitor outcomes. Um, I can assure you as a, as, a, as a data guru myself, that, that, that the team will uh, make sure that uh, we are uh, collecting pertinent data to track things such as referrals, how many patients receive immunizations, uh, whether or not they were able to be linked to Montgomery Cares, Care for Kids and some of the other uh, county programs. Um, with that being said, I will uh, stop there and I guess we'll take any questions that you may have. Um, I don't have a lot of questions. Just, uh, just again, thank you for this proposal. Uh, I think it does very much take the lessons learned of this last year in particular and how great would it have been uh, for us to have an operation like this in place to expand on mobile med, on the Mary Center, and other community-based organizations that have a mobile capacity. Um, so this this is exciting. Uh, I'll just note, I know you all have continued challenges in onboarding people, not all your fault, uh, a lot of it due to just supply and demand, frankly, of folks uh, you know, in professional settings um, who we wanna make sure are representative of the diversity of our community. Um, but any help this council can provide in onboarding these folks as quickly as possible would be great. And I have a high degree of confidence uh, in our Department of General Services, specifically uh, the fleet management team, um, who I know I can speak in the first person, do a great job of making sure that the vehicle and all that comes with it um, is, is in tip top shape and, and ready to roll. So I commend you all for this thinking. I think you've clearly given a lot of time and attention and intentionality to the staff that you've identified for this. Um, I'll just note two things. One, you know, we, we have done, I think, through your mapping and others, we've identified gaps, um, both based on zip codes, um, but also based on specific demographic groups and micro-targeting uh, within our Hispanic and immigrant community, micro-targeting uh, between our African-American and Black community, um, those communities that are not accessing any services right now, I think is this presents a real opportunity. We, as an example, learned of the significant percentage of Indigenous children and youth that are coming on this, you know, uh, next wave of unaccompanied minors. Um, and so the, there's an opportunity for us to, to really micro-target through this practice groups like that. Um, so I'm, 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 I think this is exciting. And needless to say, and you mentioned this, Dr. Rogers, our minority health initiatives and program are gonna be very interested in this uh, and, and are gonna to wanna to be involved in its rollout and implementation. So their con consistent consultation is appreciated. So do, uh, I'm not seeing any questions or comments from colleagues. So I think with that, oh, sorry, Council Member Glass. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, uh, so uh, I, I appreciate um, all the, the, the background on this and uh, just want to share with you all that I, uh, my team and I recently went to New Hampshire Estates and we were doing some uh, food distribution and talking with folks in, in the community. And uh, while I was there, we, we spoke with the principal uh, who came out and helped engage, but um, a number of the, the, the parents in the area had expressed some uh, concern because over the last year, the school-based um, health center had closed at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and that MCPS, after I inquired with MCPS, um, they had informed me that the school-based health centers run by DHHS um, 
had had in fact been closed because of the pandemic. And so as we're talking about um, these types of uh, clinics and, and opportunities, um, just curious about uh, the intersection with, with the Title I schools and, and uh, what kind of the plan is to, to increase these opportunities that are out there. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Glass, for your question. I think I, I understand what you're asking. So if I veer off, please point me back in the right direction. Well, then that, that, that would be on me for not making myself clear, but no, if you it's, want to it's take it. No, I, because I, it, it's, I'm just making sure that I, I got, I have the, the full spectrum of, of your ass, because there are a couple of, of, there's multiple components within that question that, that influence other things. So the first piece of that is, uh, so yes, the school health and wellness centers were closed, uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, and we have actually been working to reopen those. So the four larger ones that we have, um, to up county to down county, um, have been influenced by staffing, um, components. And so we did reopen the two in up county in the Gaithersburg area. Uh, and we've got that we brought those online. Monday, actually, I'm like, wait, today's Wednesday. We brought those online Monday and we're working now to shore up the staffing to be able to bring on the two down county ones, um, you know, to, to allow those services. We have worked with our, um, healthcare partners around that, you know, for example, the up county piece. When they were closed, we were seeing a higher percentage of kids accessing, uh, you know, the emergency rooms and the urgent care type facilities who have previously been getting care within that, that brick and mortar section. So I say all that to say that we brought the first wave online. We're working to bring the second wave online. And unfortunately, it's been heavily impacted by, you know, from the staffing perspective, getting those up and running in addition to getting all of the school, the regular school health rooms and health and wellness rooms up, but it's coming. It's, it's, it's in process. Now, the other component within how uh, the working with the schools and, you know, a mobile type vehicle, is that what you were asking? Uh, something. Yes. Yes. So there's, there's multiple components of that and there's multiple components within HHS that, that factor into that. So I would, uh, I will pivot and shift to Dr. Tacrow to comment on those aspects. But I think again, just in general perspectives, much like Councilmember Albernos talked about how a mobile type vehicle could work with uh, the MHIPS minority health initiatives and program, such a type of vehicle physically, as well as the concept of mobile services could also be done. Um, there could be some opportunities to partner with the health and wellness centers or the school type venues to do different activities, whether it's, you know, vaccinations or, you know, healthcare outreach in a general perspective. So the only thing I would add to that council member glass is that it, um, what Dr. Gales alluded to, and that is that, that the pandemic obviously gave us a lot of lessons around, around, Around what happens to care and safety net when and, and when, when it hits us and hits us hard and it, it caught us all off guard and all of our safety nets um, um, shorted out a little bit for for a period of time. Um, so part of part of my thinking in, in, in the department is that we are as we come out of this, we have to take a departmental look and a county look at how we managed this and what changes we need to make in our continuity of operations efforts to make sure that if we have to shut something down again. Uh, like a school wellness center that we have capacity built in and mobile vehicle would be one of those could be one of those options for how we make we regionalize the service um, and, and make sure we've got access uh, for, for the folks that are affected. Well, and I think uh, so both of you have answered the general question right that I that I was asking and, and absolutely to the point that you just made uh, Dr. Kroll yeah. if if slash when uh, you know, we have another another health health crisis, uh, you know, whether it's a pandemic or not. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have to close the, the, the school centers, uh, which in, in these communities is is um, maybe not the primary way many of the students get health care, um, but it, it is definitely a, a something that they depend upon. And so wondering if the 
th these services could be used as hubs and the mobile centers could be used as hubs to offset right the the facility that might be closed or augmented um, particularly in the in, in the title one areas uh, so your your thoughts have more succinctly answered the question that I have uh, inartfully asked, but uh, clearly you both understand and, and hopefully others understand where I was coming from. So, so I'm, I'm glad to hear this uh, clearly. The, um, the pandemic hopefully will be in the rearview mirror very soon, uh, but we never know what to expect and, and we need to have learned from this uh, situation. And so uh, building in uh, scenarios B, C and D uh, with with something like this, I think will help us in the future. So, uh, thank you for those general thoughts. Uh, I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilman Rice. I think wanted to chime in as well. Yes, yeah, so just very briefly. I I I think that again the uh, connection between our uh, BIPOC health initiatives is really something that we're going to have to look at in the future when it comes to how to best outreach. When I look at Por Nuestra Salud y Bienestar and the great success it's made in really getting into the neighborhoods uh, and what the, the chair was talking about in terms of that micro-targeting is incredibly important. When I think about a place like Cider Mill Apartments uh, in Montgomery Village and the great work that's been done there uh, in partnership with DHHS, so again, thank you, uh, when it came to robust testing and helping to support those efforts that are ongoing and then as far as vaccinations as well. Those are examples of things that we can now uh, build upon because there's a new trust that's been established, right? And so that's a part of this as well. And so the many myriads of ways in which we can continue to outreach, and I do agree with what Councilmember Glass was talking about when it comes to building that resiliency, we need to make sure that that's there and um, for whatever uh, comes about next in terms of how we best uh, continue to address the issues. But we've made such great strides. Uh, this is one in which I think that COVID has made us better uh, in terms of what it is that we need to do and also allowed us to think differently about how we're delivering our services as well. Uh, and w one of the keys that I think that we've still struggled with is building that network of doctors. Um, and I know, Dr. Crowell, we've talked about that. Dr. Gales, we've talked about that. Uh, both when it comes to our Black African American population and also with our uh, Latinx population as well, building that sort of cohort to, again, keep that trust established, keep those connectivities between health, because it is not just that our folks are getting that uh, health care at our schools or at a mobile clinic. They also do have doctors that are trusted in the community. Uh, I think about uh, Dr. Liliana Cuervo, who's my, who is the dentist for my daughters. Uh, in Montgomery Village and the great, you know, things that she's been able to do in connecting with the community. I mean, it is one where, again, uh, it's those kinds of things that we need to build those robust networks because those are the people that we're going to rely upon when it comes to, you know, vaccinations for our kids, right? And our, our, our local doctors, those kinds of things. And, and the clinics are great, but having that relationship and those folks that are there will certainly help to stem the tide of a lot of the challenges that we'll continue to see in our communities for years to come post-COVID. So uh, really just want to say again, kudos uh, for what we've done here. I completely support it, but think that there's a much larger play uh, in terms of the future of what it is that we need to do as well and look forward to working with you continuously on that. So thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Rice, and good, good questions, comments from both of you on this. And just I'll reiterate, uh, the emphasis on identifying folks on the front end that are bilingual, as you acknowledge, Dr. Rogers, is critical, and it'd be a missed opportunity uh, if if we didn't find someone. So um, just uh, want to want to further emphasize that. So without objection, uh, then uh, we approve this recommendation. And I have one other comment related to the Rescue Plan Act funding. So the staff for this initiative is funded. Um, the the executive has identified Rescue Plan Act money for this. Uh, I think it is responsive to many of the things going on. So it's not an argument about being able to use it in FY22. Uh, but I would also recommend that in your category one list, if the committee would place 500,000 in the category one list for further consideration of the unallocated money to make sure that we can transition into FY23 
there'd still be a need for some general funds to transition. I'm not recommending, you know, the whole annualized amount, but I am a little concerned, um, just like when we talked about the hubs, right? We have some big items that we need to make sure that we can um, transition as the economy comes back and our revenues come back. So my recommendation is to have the committee uh, put an item in the category one list. Sounds good, uh, without objection. Okay. Um, the next group of recommendations have to do with the programs for healthcare for the uninsured. Um, and this includes care for kids and Montgomery Cares, um, as well as uh, healthcare for the homeless, dental program and maternity partnership. And I will just start with care for kids, which actually, um, is a great segue from the comment that Council Member Glass just had because many of the children in Care for Kids are actually served through the school-based health centers. And so um, there's Care for Kids Network, which is our program for children who are not eligible for any other health care program. They're uninsured. Um, they are served in one of three ways. The largest is through a network of physicians who are willing to do this work. Um, the second is through the school-based health centers. And then the third actually is through Kaiser Permanente, which sees a cohort of children um, as, a, as a benefit. And so there's no um, cost to the county for that very robust package that they get through Kaiser. Um, I've provided in the packet some information on the budget, um, as well as the number of children. As you'll see with many of these programs, the pandemic has impacted uh, enrollment during the course of the year, but we're now starting to see enrollments come back. Uh, and so as, as we reopen, I think these programs will get back to more of their sort of past years of enrollment. However, Care for Kids, um, I'm going to say two issues. You have a recommendation from the Montgomery Cares Advisory Board um, for some positions, but this is also a program that now is going to be um, really critical in welcoming our new migrant and asylum seeking children. Um, and so the Montgomery Cares Advisory Board had recommended two positions to assist with managing uh, enrollment and care referral, a client service specialist and a medical assistant case manager. Um, I do think these are both needed based on just current workload, but also to be in preparation for what we expect to be additional children. These would have to go these next items we talk about would have to be category three items um, for you to consider for funding in the council's process. But those two issues are listed. And then also I would recommend that we put a category three item on of $100,000 um, to go into the medical provider category. Uh, the steering committee that you just heard from about you know, uh, our asylum seeking children is looking at the wide range of programs and Care for Kids is part of um, what they are looking at, but I think this would help to at least to prepare to have a little bit of buffer um, in the medical care area uh, for when those children come. Uh, and I also would just um, say that the county's had a longstanding policy, of course, of not turning away children from this program. And the council has always asked that if any additional funding is needed, um, that they be informed. So my recommendations would be category three items for the two positions recommended by the Montgomery Cares Advisory Board, um, as well as $100,000 um, for the medical um, medical provider line. And with that, I'd see if HHS had any further comments. Good. I think we're good. Um, totally concur with these recommendations. This is a wise investment, especially now. I'm really proud of how we're coordinating efforts here. Um, so without objection, without objection. Um, the next program is Montgomery Cares, and uh, this is the program for adults who are uninsured. Uh, again, your packet has some information related to this. I would say that when you look at the enrollment, again, uh, the pandemic has uh, you know, meant that we are behind where we normally are with encounters and visits, but they are starting to pick right back up. And of course, you've had discussions about how the clinics had to pivot into telehealth. Um, the, the executive has left stable the funding for the number of encounters, um, which is basically at $72,000. I think that's fine for the coming year because I think things will come back to that. 
But I did just want to touch on one of the issues, which is that in order to sustain the partner clinics in Montgomery Cares, given the pivoting to telehealth, and just as we had this discussion in the private medical sector, when people could not come and use their, you know, use their physician services, DHHS moved to a block payment um, system, and that really did help to sustain um, the clinics based on the revenues that were approximate to those that they had received in previous years. Uh, and so I wanted you to just hear a little bit from the department if they could explain what their thinking is right now on how that might continue um, for a bit more uh, and what their thoughts are for transitioning in FY22. Thank you, Linda. I will see if Dr. Rogers uh, to give those insights. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so the department, um, as Linda had mentioned, in order to provide the clinics, Montgomery Cares clinics with some financial stability uh, throughout the pandemic at the start of the pandemic due to the lower number of encounters and, be, and thus being reimbursed from a fee-for-service model or per encounter, we transitioned them to a block payment system uh, where they would get a lump sum payment um, based off of previous encounters for, uh, for, for, subsequent, for subsequent months across a number of fiscal years. And so the department, we intend to keep the block payment in existence um, throughout the COVID-19 um, state of emergency. But even after the state of emergency is lifted, we still intend to keep the block payment in, in place. And so it's important not to hastily transition the clinics back to a fee-for-service model, but rather it's important to, for the clinics to get financial setting and financial stability um, in order to, and th before we transition them back into a fee-for-service model. But in fact, the department is actually, we're looking at a long-term strategy where we would like to begin to reimburse our our McGurmey Cares providers on an alternative payment model starting in fiscal year 23. Now, there are several advantages of an alternative payment model or the block payment model, which we are beginning to see right now. And some of them are that it really uh, takes the decision of um, how to deliver care out of the hands of the payer that is the county, and it puts it into the hands of the clinics. And so the, the, the clinical teams are able to focus more on preventive care. They're able to focus on more on the most neediest patients who have the most high risk conditions. They're able to provide uh, comprehensive case managed uh, care coordinated care instead of having to worry about how many encounters I get, but rather you can, you can really better um, streamline your resources to better improve patient health, to better improve patient experiences. It also um, will allow patients to have better access to care and help to navigate the healthcare system. By really showing up our providers financially with an alternative payment model, it, it allows more care coordination between the various providers made up of their care team and allows for the, for the um, care providers to really foster enhanced decision-making amongst them and their patients. And so, I think we're going to have a, 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 a saw from the packet. We'll have a subsequent session talking a little bit more about this. So I'm not going to be able to point about the advantages of an alternative payment model. But to answer your question directly, um, we will keep the, we, we plan to um, keep the block payment in place um, post COVID-19 state of emergency. And we would like to permanently transition the clinics into an alternative payment model starting into fiscal year 23. And we are working in consultation with Montgomery Cares Advisory Board, PCC, and the Montgomery Cares Clinics to flesh out the details where that is concerned. Thank you. Okay. Um, you've gotten a request for three items for additional funding from the Montgomery Cares Advisory Board regarding uh, Montgomery Cares. The first is to add 65,000 for interpretation services that are compatible with telehealth technologies. I would say the department has been working really closely with the clinics on telehealth technology. So I know that um, this is a really critical issue for them, um, but I would say for the moment that it would be good to put this on the category three list. And of course, as you revisit um, in the next two weeks, I can get some further information about how this might be used by the department. Um, because I know they have been working on the different platforms and the language capacities. Uh, the second is to increase funding for the psychiatric services by 63,100. 
This is actually to be able to maintain the same number of psychiatric consultation hours because the provider has indicated that there will be a price increase, although um, even at the increased price, it's really sort of still a, a below private market price. And so I would recommend that that also go on the category three list. There is an increase uh, request for increased funding for specialty care. Um, I think given uh, how the council likes to have some options that in this case, I would just recommend that if you put the two, if you put this on the category um, three list that we put the $100,000 on category three, and then we could put the $122,000 on the category two list for you to revisit. Or if you um, like, you could also have two items on category three, but I think having an option around this is um, uh, probably a good idea to be able to uh, have an option to not have to look at the whole 222,000. Uh, that all makes a lot of sense. So I think without objection. Okay. All right. Um, I did just put in an item here on the maternity partnership program. Um, there is there is no funding request. Um, the funds have been sufficient to to um, meet the number of people who enroll. But I would just say there's a new solicitation out, so that's really exciting. It's going to expand beyond just hospital partners, um, which I think could give people some different options in care. And I know that the department is working really hard to make sure that um, women who need prenatal services get enrolled into this program and is doing um, some different outreach and you know, some different models around this. So I did just want to highlight that for you. It's not a budget item per se. It's just, you know, sustaining the existing funding. Okay. Um, the next item is county dental services. Uh, and so in this item, uh, I just did want to say that you all have previously had a lot of discussions about dental, um, trying to work to get this program back on track. Dr. Boyce, who you um, were able to meet with in previous meetings, uh, really pre-pandemic had talked to you about some great strategies, some great planning um, that she was doing, bringing in different resources. And then of course you have had some discussions about the dental clinics, the work they've had to do both in facility and staffing um, to reopen. Uh, and so uh, I did ask one specific question um, in response to uh, the, the expectation that we will have some more migrant children about where they are with um, the pediatric efforts. As you'll recall, this was a big area for Dr. Boyce in bringing in pediatrics. And so in your packet, and I would let DHHA see if they had any further comments, but I think you'll see that um, there have been additions of pediatric dentists. Um, they also have a focus on language capacity uh, and uh, oral surgery, specialty care. So it does seem like that has really, really made tremendous um, progress, even in the midst of the pandemic. And so I didn't know if Dr. Gales might want to comment on that. Sure. Thank you, Linda, for, for highlighting it. Um, and going back to the earlier comment, this continues to be one of the areas that, you know, Public health has not stopped in the pandemic, and the team has continued to move forward and make great, great progress. Um, and a lot of this was in response to those conversations that you referenced with this very same subcommittee about issues around cultural competency, language access, um, improving the patient care experience, as well as increasing provisions in terms from a provider perspective. Uh, and Dr. Boyce and team have made, as you referenced, uh, a number of additions to the program to bolster the program and to create a more solidified county infrastructure that um, you know, quite frankly, I think we know we need to continue to make investments in while we also explore the opportunity to bring on partnerships and working more closely with the community. Uh, one of the projects that had been started before COVID and has continued with recent conversations is the idea of how to increase uh, you know, referral patterns to those community sites, particularly those dental programs who are a part of uh, or are affiliated with clinics who are part of the Montgomery Cares app apparatus, um, as well as continuing to look at uh, workforce strategies and solutions. One of the ones that we've talked about before is making, you know, our dentist and our our dental providers actual county employees um, in an effort to be able to retain them and to recruit others 
um, in a competitive way um, so that we're not constantly bringing on contractors and losing them if they were to uh, get full-time positions in other areas. So we are excited about the progress that has been made. We do recognize that there is still significant work to be done um, in those areas that I just mentioned. And we, you know, we appreciate your continued support uh, in supporting those efforts. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Rice wanted to make a point on this. So yeah, I, I just wanted to highlight again the success of the outreach uh, and really want to thank you. It is incredibly important as we grow and continue to make sure that we're making those connections. While uh, it's great to see the connectivity there, we know uh, that many in our communities, especially our communities of color, have been disconnected from health all around, especially when it comes to dental care, because so many were so fearful of uh, the ideology around having your mouth open and having a doctor right there in front of you working in that space. And we heard that anecdotally from people throughout our communities uh, and has been one of the concerns that I've had, not only when it comes to our adult population, but especially our children population. And I know that we're about to get into that next, Linda, but just wanted to highlight uh, the great success. Uh, we need to build on that. And so I completely support uh, what we're doing. Uh, we've talked about this for a very long time and really want to thank you, Dr. Gales. Uh, also thank Dr. Boyce and Dr. Kroll for continuing to work uh, in this respect to get us closer to where we have uh, more access uh, for people, especially from a linguistic standpoint, uh, understanding that the need is tremendous. Uh, and especially for some of our children who may be arriving from other countries, we know how much uh, work is going to need to be done. Many of them have not received any kinds of services at all in their entire lifetimes. And so from that perspective, we'll need even more of these uh, doctors uh, to be able to make sure that they're giving uh, the oral support, uh, oral health support that's necessary for our kids. So thank you. I agree. I'll also just one last point. I know that um, we're, I think we've done a good job of being intentional about creating career pathways uh, for emerging and necessary positions. Uh, I think we need to be more intentional about including dental in those pathways and working with our colleagues through both MCPS um, as well as um, Workforce Montgomery. Uh, and to, to, to go further upstream uh, and try to plant some seeds that will hopefully eventually pay dividends in folks entering the dental practice. Because it is, it's, it's gone down uh, as an industry, let alone finding folks who are uh, in a position to understand the cultural and ethnic needs that are unique to different communities. So this is one of those where I think we can be systemic and rising up. And I actually think pre-pandemic, one of the things we were going to do was actually have a session with USG, with universities at Shady Grove, right? Because we were, Dr. Boyce had been working on trying to have a partnership um, with them in addition to really, you know, building up the partnership with Howard University. So um, hopefully we can get back to that kind of work. <laughs> yeah, and it, 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 it's, a, it's a modest investment on the front end to meet students part of the way to provide some scholarships and incentivize um, cause it's in our own best interest. Uh, so, um, but anyways, I'd love to have that follow up conversation. So maybe we can target the fall for that as well. Great. So without objection there as well. Okay. So, um, but, so you have a couple of items from, uh, Montgomery cares advisory board and one which has, um, a little revision, uh, because we know we have our enthusiastic council member rice, who's always a uh, good supporter of dental. But let me just say on the first one, there was a recommendation for 125,000 for additional resources for merit and or contractual staff. Um, I would, I, my recommendation to you is sort of twofold. You could put this on uh, category three in two pieces because it's not specific to a position. So you could put on the 75,050 or um, you can tell me to put it all on one piece. But I would just say that the department, while Dr. Gales has mentioned the need to really look at this issue around merit staffing, um, the department has indicated that one of their priorities is to get the, um, the pay rate for their contractors increased so that they can retain their contractors and attract those folks. And so I just would say that if this money's approved, 
it would I would want the committee to also be recommending that the department could use it that way um, to be able to increase contractor pay as opposed to necessarily adding a position. Okay. Would you like it all in one piece or would you like it in two? Two is fine with me. I think that's okay. Okay. So two pieces yeah. and the caveat that the department can use it for contractual pay. Okay. I'll note two is better than one. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the second item that came from Montgomery CARES was $175,000 to institute a school-based sealant program at MCPS elementary schools. Um, and uh, Montgomery CARES Advisory Board did follow up um, based on requests from Council Member Rice, who was interested in seeing if this idea of school-based um, preventive and uh, basic dental services could be accelerated beyond what the original recommendation was. And so uh, Montgomery Care's Primary Care Coalition came back with an increased proposal for $250,000 uh, in place of the $175,000 and discussed what they saw as parameters around a program that could serve 16 schools. Um, I did ask uh, HHS, um, based on the original recommendation, about what their priority would be in terms of school-based. And you'll see that the response was that they do want to pilot school-based preventive services. Uh, I, I would like you to hear a little bit of their thoughts around this. And again, I think it's it's not the level of funding, it's just making sure that the department can get back to you on how best that they would structure such a program and so that it's clear, you know, you're not, um, picking any one structure, but I'll let Dr. Gale speak to that a little bit. No, I, I, Linda, you said it beautifully. I don't have much to add other than, you know, that's the goal is to find out what works and what the best practices are uh, and what's the best way to utilize the funds available. Um, and, you know, this is consistent with the ceiling program. It's also consistent. I know one of the other items to come up is the notion of hiring a consultant to do you know, consider outside relationships is, you know, given some of those other things uh, that are quite pressing in terms of shoring up our workforce and things like that, um, our approach has been that, you know, if there are funds available in the short term to utilize those funds to shore up the infrastructure that we've been working on as we continue to explore those other partnerships. And then again, for example, this with the pilot, uh, making sure that we have good data points to know what works before we scale it up and put it, you know, put it across the board to make sure that the investment uh, is realized and, uh, you know, there aren't any funds that are encumbered to use for the programs that go wasted or unused. Right. And so, and one option you have would be that you could take it as two category three items and do the original 175,000 and then a second as 75,000 or um, if the committee wanted to, you know, you could put it all in in one piece. Uh, Councilman Rice wanted to make some comments. So let me just say that again, the only reason why I feel really strongly about this one, so I'm just going to ask for some deference from my colleagues and from Dr. Gales on this one, is because um, many of our children have not seen a dentist in over a year and are going to be returning to our schools and will present with uh, dental problems. Uh, and so because of that, I'm, I'm fearful of a rush of folks who are then going to be experiencing problems and challenges as they're already uh, coupled with that, all of the other challenges that they're gonna face about returning to school for the first time in a little over a year uh, and, and what that means. Uh, and so from that perspective, I just really feel as though we're behind the eight ball at this point. We were making great progress uh, before COVID and really starting to ramp up. And just as I highlighted the success of uh, the additional pediatric dentist who we added on. I mean, look, we, we were doing some great things. And then all of a sudden, things screeched to a halt. And so the lack of dental services for so many uh, has been there. I mean, including myself, I'll just be completely honest and transparent. I have it, and I need to schedule an opportunity. And I normally regularly go to the dentist, and it hasn't been because of you know COVID and all the interruptions and all of the scheduling and all the challenges. And so it really is one in which it is incredibly important uh, for us to make sure that we're doing this. And so from that perspective, I just really feel as though this money can go a long way in terms of continuing to provide expanded services, reach folks where they are, 
give them the convenience and also give them the support that, that I feel will be necessary for many who are going to present. In addition to, as I said before, uh, those who may be unaccompanied minors who are coming, uh, children fleeing violence and the necessity that they may have, coupled with all of the other stuff that we have, it just makes sense to have that there, I know, and have the utmost confidence uh, that Health and Human Services will be able to appropriately uh, address how the money's spent. And so for me, Linda, it would be one where we work in the most flexibility in terms of language uh, to allow for you to make sure strategically you are allowed to do what is best. Obviously, there are some things that stand at the beginning in terms of uh, that are the most importance, but obviously want to give deference to uh, the department who has continued to lead in this effort and do some great work. So that would be my thoughts there. Got it. Uh, so you concur with the committee? Re the one, one item of 250 of okay. flexible language, correct? Correct. You've got it, Linda. Okay. I agree. Councilmember Glass. Okay. Right. Thank you, guys. Um, the next item uh, is the $40,000 that's requested for a study on designing a coordinated um, dental safety net system. And this uh, came forth as the desire to have more information on how best to design the system with our uh, clinical partners that aren't the county dental program. I would just say that uh, DHHS is in the midst of the community health needs assessment. I've heard Dr. Rogers speak to this um, at a couple meetings. I'm not recommending this specific funding at this time. I think the, the goal, the intent of the request is like spot on, but I think you would be better to hear some more what comes out of the community health needs assessment and get a better scope from the department before moving forward with funding for this item. Seeing heads nod from our public health team, so uh, we will we'll come back to this one. Okay. Um, the next item that you have is health care for the homeless, and this program um, provides primary care for homeless residents who aren't eligible for um, other funding sources, but it also addresses the ongoing medical case management needs, and it works with hospitals and facilities on discharge plans. Um, and as you know, and we've already discussed the medical needs of many of our homeless or our folks in permanent supportive housing are indeed complex. Um, discharge planning is specifically complex, especially when it comes to discharge planning from psychiatric facilities. Um, there is a request for $75,000, which would be a category three item to add uh, an additional position for psychiatric discharge planning. Um, I would recommend putting this on category three. I know that um, it is it is really um, time consuming and hard for the current staff sometimes to really work through some of these plans. And Ms. Harris can address this if you have questions. Councilmember Glass, did you want to add anything to this? Uh, no, uh, Ms. McMillan uh, summed it up perfectly. And we've we've been throughout this conversation, we've been talking about uh, the the increased needs and support. So, uh, I think it speaks for itself. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, the last budget request from the Montgomery Cares Advisory Board was to allocate five hundred thousand dollars in ARPA funding to um, address you know, deferred care or post pandemic recovery efforts. Um, this really there's no reason why you couldn't place this in the category one category, you know, as an option. So at least that you can come back and consider it. Um, I would say, you know, there was nothing specific behind the $500,000, but um, certainly the way the council's process is set up, um, you know, placing it in a category one list would give you the option to come back and uh, see what, you know, see what more specific um, issues may have arisen. So uh, I don't know if the committee is interested in holding that funding as well. I think another sound recommendation. Okay. Um, I did just want to highlight for you that in the advocacy piece you received, there are several policy issues. Um, this is budget work session, so um, I'm just highlighting those for you. I think that you know the department continues to work with everybody on many of these policy issues around eligibility and process, um, and certainly we can get response from the department and updates and have future sessions on it. 
Um, so I did just want to highlight for you that they brought those concerns to your attention. I appreciate that. And I just want to thank the coalition for their continued leadership and dedication. Uh, they're such strong partners on so many different levels. I'll just make one editorial note here. I think we've opened a lot of doors over this last year and working with our private sector medical providers as well. And there are relationships built that I know our public health team has established and expanded on in this last year. And so I think as we think about and expand you know, some of these initiatives and programs. Um, I'd love Dr. Kroll, uh, and I know Dr. Gills had to, to step out, but for us to have a follow-up discussion on how to more intentionally fuse, because you've done a great job, Dr. Kroll, opening doors uh, and lines of communication uh, and and uh, had, and been very open to it, uh, which I've really appreciated, um, but whether it's dental practices or um, medical private practices, there's a strong interest from those private medical groups to be part of the solution, to help uh, in some way. And we all learned over this last year that they actually have some pockets of programs in place um, that we weren't aware of um, that, that I think could be leveraged uh, and expanded upon. And so I uh, would love to come back to that as well. Maybe not the fall, maybe wait, wait for the winter for that one, because there's a lot to get to in the fall, but a committee session to discuss how we may fuse moving forward um, and continue to leverage both our private medical practices and primary care facilities. Council, Member, uh, Council uh, Chair Albert, as I, I share that that sentiment, you know, when we when we went when we started this pandemic, we lost a lot of our safety net um, for for a brief period of time, and so the the, the providers, the market care clinics, and other providers came back online as soon as they they, they felt they could do that. I want to make sure that as we go forward, we don't have that opportunity to happen again, that we make sure that our, that our safety net is our safety net no matter what happens. And I think that one of the things that they've demonstrated, our, our partners have demonstrated this year is, is some resiliency in coming back and an understanding of the need to be there uh, and to figure out how to be there going forward um, for the next thing that happens to us and, and for all the services that we have to provide as part of this recovery. So I'm looking forward to that conversation and, and to see what, what we build and how we build it back better to quote uh, uh, President Biden. Great. And the last item in this packet actually is from committee chair Albernaz, and it has to do with putting some funding on the category two list, 125,000, um, so that the committee can come back to consider uh, how to address social isolation of seniors. Um, there is a little bit of information in your packet just from the CDC about um, how impactful on people's health, isolation, and loneliness can be. Um, I know that the council member um, had received one proposal, but the recommendation here is to put $125,000 on Category 2, and then you would be able to come back, um, he hear about other efforts, hear from the community, have a discussion with DHHS, but this would um, leave that item open. So with that, um, Council Member Auermaz. Thank you, Ms. McMillan. You framed it perfectly. One of the primary recommendations from the Commission on Aging was addressing senior isolation issues, which we know have significant um, medical health costs associated with them. So in addition to being morally the right thing to do to help our seniors that have, you know, we, we have all focused so much as we should on children, youth, and families and the trauma they've experienced. Our seniors, as all of my colleagues have noted, um, have experienced tremendous trauma as well. Um, major milestone events missed, um, disconnection from families, and uh, it, it's been hard uh, to say the least. And so one of the silver linings is this county has been very progressive in establishing multi-generational programming. Um, and uh, over generations now, um, our county has has really led uh, in this space um, and and really been intentional about both establishing community based organizations who specialize in multi generational services, but also nonprofit organizations who've added this uh, to to their services. So I uh, um, so the proposal is 125,000, essentially a placeholder. Uh, that we would come back to. And this specific program that was brought to my attention from Catholic Charities, this Pathways Initiative, I was really blown away by. 
um, and, and, and very excited about. And, and what I'd like to be able to do is have a broader conversation and hopefully not just support this specific proposal, um, but see how it fits with the broader initiative. And thank you, Dr. Kroll, for speaking to me early this morning, because uh, I hadn't had a chance to brief you on this over the weekend, but I appreciated your uh, general support for this. Uh, and it was spot on with what Dr. Brunetto has been working on uh, for some time now. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking forward to, to carrying this effort forward. And I want to thank Catholic Charities uh, and the folks in the community who brought this to my attention. Um, and I also want to thank my colleagues uh, who have been um, very strong leaders in intergenerational programming uh, in their own right. So uh, with that, I'd like to move this 125000 in Phase 2 that we will come back to shortly after the budget and figure out how to get implemented. Uh, second, all right. So uh, with that, I think that's unanimous. And that is the end of that packet. And the next packet has to do with your follow-up on telehealth. Um, and so uh, Dr. Elliott and Ms. Chauvel are on, and Ms. Harris is still on, in addition to Dr. Kroll. Um, I, I don't need to remind you so much. We had, like, this terrific discussion. You were briefed, and we had this terrific discussion about telehealth and really the opportunities for innovation and, of course, I was um, struck by this again when we were talking about the service hubs and, you know, the potential um, that lies there in terms of uh, trusted places in the community. But I also did just want to say that following um, the last meeting, Ms. Harris and um, Lasagna Kelly, who's in healthcare for the homeless, and I, we met with Mary's Center because we were so really intrigued by the comments they had made about partnerships on how to serve the homeless, especially around mental health. Um, and so um, I, I, I did just want to bring that to your attention. And then uh, in terms of the packet, um, council staff is recommending 250000 be in the Category 1 list, so we could come back to this um, and talk about proposals. But I thought you might want to just hear a little bit from Ms. Harris and Dr. Elliott and Ms. Chauvel just in some of the follow-up thoughts and see what Dr. Kroll's comments might be as well. Well, we absolutely do, because I know all of us got so much energy from this conversation and briefing that we had before. I, I've referred to it many times in many meetings I've been in as one of the silver linings of this past year, uh, and that presents some really legitimate and authentic opportunities for us to help address some of the public health disparities that existed prior to the pandemic. Um, I'll only just a timekeeper check. We've got about 20 minutes before we lose this line. Um, so uh, I, I don't think this is going to get objection from my colleagues either, but I would love to, to get that um, update. So with that, turn it over to the team uh, to, to, as a follow-up to the really amazing briefing that we had before. Dr. Well, I'll, I'll just, uh, yeah, I think Perfect. you're asking for Amanda and, and, and uh, Dr. Elliott to weigh in on this, but I'll just simply say that I, that, that this is part of a larger frame for me in terms of telehealth and how our, our partners and the department begin to reach out and use the tools that we put in place during COVID and, and build on them. So uh, what Dr. Elliott is proposing, I think, is, is potentially a model for how all of our partners and multiple of our partners will go forward in, in engaging with folks to homelessness piece, I'll leave Amanda to speak to because it has a particular, uh, we have a particular need uh, in, in that area that she can speak to. So. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Uh, again, it's always a pleasure, uh, number one. Number two, I, I it definitely, I think really it's a story about care coordination. And and I think the biggest thing that that um, that I would like to do is um, not to pass the buck, but hand it off to Leah. She's the director of care coordination. And I think that Leah can, can give a great, um, um, uh, a few words um, on Mary Center's behalf. Hi, thank you for having us. Um, so we have had, we've been also very excited about all of the momentum and movement uh, with Montgomery County and these initiatives that we're hoping to push forward and plan for. Um, we have had follow-up discussions uh, even past the, the meeting with, uh, <laughs> with Linda McMillan, um, even yesterday with Lasagna Kelly and uh, Elizabeth uh, Driggers related to the housing initiative program. And I think that there is a lot of interest um, in trying to move some of this facilitated telemedicine and uh, behavioral health care um, into some of the people's homes and into pop-ups. So we're uh, very excited and hopeful and 
you know, are very much still interested in some of the other opportunities involved that uh, we discussed last time as well with regard to AI and the partnerships um, that we had talked about then as too, as well. So thank you. You know, one okay, of the things one. I wanted to add real quick, I'm sorry, Amanda, is that um, right. the discussion about dentistry was interesting because we are working on a teledental <laughs> program. <laughs> And so that was absolutely piquing my interest very high. Uh, and so hopefully we can have some other offering in addition to the telemedical. We have a teledental pop up uh, offering as well. Sorry, Matt. That's okay. Thank you, Dr. Elliott. Uh, thank you, Leah. Uh, I'm very excited about this partnership and I really appreciate the approach of the facilitated telehealth because I have to say just straight telehealth makes me very nervous uh, that it cuts out a lot of people, especially folks with significant behavioral health issues, medical issues, people experiencing homelessness. So I think this is such a, a unique way to stretch our resources and be able to reach people. And I'm particularly interested in the, the behavioral health and psychiatric component so that we can actually bring psychiatric services out to the streets. Um, we, de we definitely have people that are unsheltered, are experiencing a lot of significant behavioral health symptoms and just are not going to come into a clinic. They're not going to, and it's hard to pay a psychiatrist to actually go out and do street outreach. It'd be great if they would do that, but it's also not the most cost effective way of approaching it. So I think being able to do this in a, in a facilitated way makes a lot of sense. So I look forward to the, the continued partnership. Terrific. Uh, Leah, did you want to add anything? Um, no, I think I think uh, we've said it in all of the various different uh, environments that we've been invited to. I think, you know, we're we're all excited to be able to allow for increased access to care. Um, you know, it sounds like that's one of the major priorities that is happening right now overall. And I think that this model certainly allows us to do that and allows us to integrate both our facilitated model, our a virtual model and then hopefully eventually into the clinics as well so that we can really provide comprehensive care um, and introduce them into our social change model to hopefully uh, be able to support some of those other social determinants as well. Uh, Councilman, sorry, Councilmember Glass would like to speak. Let me just make one point. Um, so I've also discussed this before in previous sessions, but another thing that gave me a lot of energy recently was getting a briefing in our public safety committee about how first responders are using telemedicine and telehealth, particularly ambulance providers. Uh, and obviously 911 next generation technology uh, is, is now gives us the capability uh, to put us in a much better position for diagnosis uh, to, to, to determine who to dispatch to various issues. And um, they're, they're right now partnering with some urgent care facilities. They, uh, uh, Montgomery County Fire and Rescue, is partnering with some urgent care facilities to deter people from having to go to the emergency room um, to address some issues. I think there's, and I mentioned this during the Public Safety Committee, I think there's an application to our primary care clinics, and in particular the Mary Center, who already has the back-end capability, as we've learned through this briefing, on how to do this right. Um, but, but I think, you know, as another evolution of this, I'd love to follow up on that as well uh, to be intentional about connecting that dot because I think that could, could further expand this, this really important ecosystem. Uh, but Councilmember Glass. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm sensitive of the time, so I'll just be brief. You know, I, I'm very excited about these initiatives, and I know that my office has been involved in a lot of different conversations with Mary Center and, and Ms. Harris and her team. Uh, you know, trying to figure out how to uh, combine the the housing components with the healthcare needs that are out there. And I particularly want to give a shout out to uh, Valeria Carranza from my team for being integral into those those conversations. And uh, Mary Center does incredible work, uh, but I know that you are part of a, a network of health-based clinics uh, here in the D.C. region and in Montgomery County as well. And I, uh, I, I would like to uh, encourage the committee as we uh, engage more of these conversations. Um, you know, let let let's uh, let's figure out how other organizations are also playing roles. You know, I know that there's the CCI uh, Health Health and Wellness Services uh, based here in Silver Spring as well, and uh, a number of other groups too. And so, would love to at some non-budgetary time, right, figure out how we can 
uh, collaborate and figure out what all the different pieces are here. And I know, uh, Dr. Kroll, you're immersed in this, uh, but I would love, and I'm sure the committee would love to, to get a better sense of that landscape too. So keep up the good work and look forward to, to seeing these initiatives move forward. Great. Okay, uh, Councilman Rice, did you have anything you wanted to add? Nope. All right, so uh, I think without objection, we um, also concur with this recommendation as well. Great, thank you. All right. And I believe that's it, right, Ms. McKellen? Nope. You've got, uh, Vivian has a item nope. on uh, VITA and taxes. Right, ah, sorry, yes. <laughs> and Councilmember Glass has a proposal uh, that he'd like to discuss here as well. Ms. Yao. Um, so, yes, Council Member Glass, in, in a May 4th memorandum to the committee, requested that the committee consider expanding funding to the VITA program and other nonprofit support tax support programs to better, better serve low income residents. Um, and I, I can brief it, but if Mr. Glass wants to uh, do that, then that would that's fine. <laughs> sure. sure. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yao. So just in brief, uh, the reason I put forth this proposal is there's been a lot of moving pieces with regards to, you know, individual taxes over the last year. Uh, there have been, you know, new laws and credits given at the state level, uh, at the federal level, uh, expansions at the state level, uh, Chair uh, Albernaz and uh, co-leads Navarro uh, and also CATS have introduced legislation uh, that I know uh, Councilmember Rice and I are, are co-sponsoring uh, that would expand uh, the earned income tax credit through the county's Working Families Income Supplemental Program. So all of that is to say, um, you know, there is more relief that is going to be given to our, our lowest income residents, but there is a backlog in the VITA program to have county uh, support help them in the filing of these tax returns, which are now just getting even more complicated. And so uh, upon hearing of the backlog through constituents who had reached out to me, um, I put this proposal out there so that all of the, the good um, tax-based reforms that are being made across all government levels um, can actually be accessed. And that's the point of, of this recommendation and proposal. Well, I think it makes a lot of sense. I appreciate you putting this forward, Council Member Glass. Uh, and I had the opportunity to see the program in person two years ago. Uh, Ms. Strauss took me on a tour. I was incredibly impressed with the consultations that were going on. And I shared at the time a personal story of that actually triggered. I had forgotten. Uh, but when I was a kid, my dad used to take me with him. He was an account. He is an accountant. He's retired. Um, but he would go. We lived in Gaithersburg um, when I was young. And we would visit apartment complexes and my dad would pro provide free legal tax services uh, to, to working families. Um, and so it just, it was, a, it was like a, it was a very emotional moment for me, honestly. Um, so I, I totally concur with this. I think it makes a lot of sense and this is a wise investment. It will help families uh, further prevent and go down a road where uh, they, they have additional burdens, financial burdens, and we know what happens uh, when folks go far too far down that road. So um, totally concur with this and appreciate you bringing it forward. Council Member Rice. Just very quickly, just want to thank uh, Council Member Glass and I couldn't agree with you more. This is incredibly important. It is incredibly confusing, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of everything that's happening, whether it's unemployment, uh, so many things and folks just aren't sure and so to just be able to have that guidance to give people the assurance, you know, folks may be able to figure it out, but we'd much rather have them have the professional help and make sure that they get it right. So that just as you said, Mr. Chair, they're not going down a road to where there are some other financial repercussions uh, as a result. Uh, we don't want that for any of our folks. And so understand that this is just a confusing time with so many different things that are going on that we put in place to help folks. But when it comes to tax preparation, uh, where to put all of those things and how best to acknowledge some of the help that they've received and make sure that it's all filed properly is incredibly important. So thank you, Councilmember Glass, and thank you uh, to VITA and all of the leadership there that continues to protect our residents and give them that support that's necessary. So thank you. Great. So I think it sounds unanimous, Ms. Yao. 
Well, um, we don't have necessarily a specific amount, so I just wanted to go over that. Um, okay. And just to let you know that we did, the council did receive testimony from United Way of the Greater Water, of the DC Metropolitan Region, as well as the Community Action Board. Um, council staff had reached out to executive staff to get some information, but there wasn't enough time to get it back for the packet publication, and that included about the level of service being provided and the challenges with COVID, as well as the resources needed to expand capacity. Um, so, it, again, we have executive staff here. If they're able to speak to that, that's great. If not, council staff recommended a placeholder amount to support additional staffing, as well as operating expenses to support enhanced outreach. So I see, um, by the way, amazing beard, Mr. Rundell. I, I am super <laughs> jealous. Um, you look great. I, I mean, that's, that is awesome. Uh, but did you have anything you wanted to add or Ms. Lambert? I, I can, I, I'll speak to it real quick. I believe the, the uh, amount we've calculated is virtually the same as what Ms. Yao put forth in the packet. Um, with slight changes of the composition, it might be more staff at one time and not year round, but I think we would be supportive of the amount in the packet and would be able to use that amount to, uh, to provide the services necessary. Terrific. Appreciate you both. Thank you. I'll, I'll just say that's really good accounting, Ms. Yao. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So I think the placeholder amount sounds appropriate. Uh, so I think we are in good shape here with the unanimous, unanimous support from the committee. Oh, and by the way, I just did want to say that um, we targeted as one time only uh, ARPA funding. Um, and hopefully the council can prioritize that funding to come in the earlier stages rather than later stages of ARPA. Right. So to be clear, this is uh, phase two, um, but, um, but, but to, that it would be implemented earlier rather than later. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, appreciate that. So I think with that, correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Yao, but that was the last item we were discussing this morning. That's correct. Okay. Um, great, everyone. Then we are adjourned with seven minutes to spare before we lose this line. So thank well you. Well done, Mr. Chair. Uh, we appreciate you uh, and your hard work. And thank you again, Ms. Strauss. Uh, th this wouldn't have been so easy if it weren't for, frankly, your team's dedication on this. So thank you. I really appreciate it. I, I want to say that we're hearing that free tax capacity throughout the state is down between 80 and 90 percent mm -hmm. so that we've been able to kind of um, do what we've been able to do is really a compliment to my team as well as all of the volunteers who are working virtually to support them. And of course, our partners uh, at RSVP um, and our nonprofit. So thank you so much and uh, appreciate the support of the United Way in um, doing some really innovative outreach with us this year yeah i think in the entertainment business you always want to end on a high so uh <laughs> let's end on a high thank you all very much uh with that we are thank you so much